very low, um, uh, very low variable cost. So, you know, the, the tendency is going to be to produce as, met, as much as you can in a given year. So when you have that, the only thing that can give, given your very stable supply and very volatile demand, is pricing. And we see that, um, we see that in the market. It's been better over the past six months, but um, we know that we can be susceptible to big changes in what let's call global determinants of demand. Um, one last comment on this, and that's that you know we we are hearing that the, the uh, programs and subsidies in the in the Chinese market are, are tended to remain stable into the next year. So that's great. We're we're hoping to to lean on that heavily. Let's talk a little bit about the U.S. market dynamics. So. Um, Trying to break down the um, the U.S. market as a subset of that global market. Um, again, global market for PV modules about 100 gigawatts in 2018. The U.S. market across all installation types, we're hoping it's going to be about 13 percent, so 13 gigawatts. Um, if you break down, you know what 2018 is going to look like in the U.S. market. Um, well over two thirds of that is non-residential. So. Um, uh, rooftop commercial, you may call it community solar, and then the big boys, you know, utility scale projects, behind the fence, massive PPA, you know, 200 plus megawatt fields. Um, so given those dynamics, again, we see if you were going to map this out, this would be kind of, you know, concentric circles where um, I've got this, the outermost circle, the global market, 100 gigawatts of, of, of PV modules. Um, the U.S. market, 13% of that. And of that, you know, 10 plus is is non-residential so it, when we think about the global the, the dynamics at play on the um residential you know um pv market most of that's going to be uh things really outside of our control um the global market driven by you know demand from large players like china and india um the u.s market as well driven by um what's going on in those larger markets of utility scale and, and commercial um, really has an impact on the types of products we see here in the U.S. as well as the, the availability and the supply. And I say that because, um, you know, somewhere somewhere well upstream of where, where we typically see modules, but usually at the manufacturer level and sometimes at the at the at the cell level, um, you know, you're gonna you, you get to a point in the in the supply chain and those cells have you know they don't have a destination yet, they don't have a home. Um, in terms of which specific modules are they going into. Um, they may not have a home in terms of which um, manufacturers will they be sold into. Um, you know, it's basically a, a kind of a raw technology output. Um, then there's going to be a market for those, for those cells, for those wafers, um, amongst the individual module manufacturers, and then each one of those has to make decisions. Do I make this a, um, do I make this a 72 cell module for the U.S. market? Or will this end up being a 60 cell module for uh, maybe the Southeast Asia or the European market? Um, you know, all of that's done. Obviously, it's a little more advanced than doing it on spreadsheets, but you know, every company and every uh, every region has has those planning um, models to figure out where do they think the demand is going to come from, where's the best um, where are the best prospects for I guess the most um, you know the the most efficiency um, and that's a bad term but what I mean by that is when you're when you're one of these large module manufacturers and you think about where are you going to invest your resources or your capacity uh, you know a lot of that is looking into which markets do you think are going to have you know the biggest um, call it under supply where do you think you, you'll be able to um, I guess get the most profit or get the most revenue for each one of those modules taking into account you know what does it cost to sell into a market what Kind of overhead do I have to carry? Um, and and each one of these markets is different in terms of what's the infrastructure needed, um, how much support is needed. Is this something where, um, you know, in the utility scale project, I might I might sell you know 200 or, or 500 or a gigawatt um, of capacity in a given you know in a given period um, to to three or four customers or something where I have to be more invested in the market long term and it's a, it's a channel or it's a distribution play. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm straying a little bit, but it's, it's just a remarkable example. If you're, you know, economics major, like I was of, um, how the, the greater forces really shape what we see here in the U S market. Um, 
in terms of what products get offered here, you know, is there excess capacity for some of these projects? Um, are, um, you know, if there's not excess capacity, if there's, you know, constraint, then you see some of those large projects that just, you know, don't get quoted and installed. And it really has an impact on the, um, you know, the pull through and um, the, obviously when prices rise, you're gonna see lower volume because um, you'll usually have, usually have lower demand at higher prices. Uh, and we see some interesting impacts here over the past couple of years in the, uh, in the US market. So looking on the left, um, when we think, when we look at, at, you know, historical actuals versus forecasts, we see some interesting blips. Um, when module prices were very low in 2016, um, at the tail end of 2016, huge, huge pipelines get installed. Um, when, when markets tightened up um, at the beginning of the year, um, of, in 2017, a lot of that had to do with tariff expectations, a lot of safe harboring going on. Um, and um, at the beginning of 2018, we saw, you know, a little bit more of a slowdown in terms of uh, not installations, but in terms of, um, you know, direct volumes or imports. Um, you know, we've seen lots of headlines on that. Imports were down substantially um, due to the tariff impacts. Um, so really, again, this slide is just kind of an illustration of the, um, the, the greater impact on the residential market being you know, uh, non-residential, rooftop, and large utility scale solar. Recent trends in pricing. So, um, you know, again, this is, uh, this is through the lens of, I guess, all, um, all silicon wafer cell module prices into the U.S. regardless of installation type. So, Going back to our previous slide, two thirds of the market being utility scale that's extremely price sensitive, um, you know, really pulling down and having an impact on um, uh, pricing throughout the supply chain. Um, so very interesting to look back and think about, you know, kind of what we were buying and, and, and what we were selling in, in each of those periods um, and how, how quickly some of those changes came, you know, Q1 to Q2 2018. Um, Module prices uh, fell in the U.S. in response to weak demand and competitive bidding for the market. Um, the next slide here, I think, is a little more impactful in terms of tariff impact. So some great data here uh, from Wood McKenzie. Those are the guys that, uh, you know, formerly known as Green Tech Media. Still, you know, great analysis on state-by-state uh, -state markets. Um, also here, top left, is uh, some information from Energy Sage. So uh, Energy Sage, really interesting. Um, you know, in really interesting platform out there for aggregating um, aggregating customers and, and really a lead channel. I think if executed well, uh, I'd be interested in hearing from some of you guys out there that have used Energy Sage and uh, and participated on the market front. Um, being a little further upstream, you know, my my typical interaction with Energy Sage is really just trying to take a look at the data they've got available of what's you know what's quoted through their system to homeowners and and really what sells. Um, so when they, you know, when they aggregate up all that data of all of those proposals across all those markets, some really interesting um, takeaways here. Um, and really what, what we're tracking here in the top left is historical prices, dollars per watt for installed systems. Um, and we really see, you know, a great improvement on, on, um, on, on unit economics for homeowners, you know, decreases from the 375 watt per watt range um, in July 2015. Just, you know, just two years later, think about that, down quoting, you know, right at that $3 per watt range. Um, and that's um, the other thing you see that's interesting there is Energy Sage can show you the breakdown across different states, what the average prices are. Um, try to put a link in here when we, when we post this out to you, but some really interesting data here. Um, and because they're doing this, you know, kind of more or less in real time, um, they can really show the impacts from month to month on where the average price is being quoted. Um, so again, if you were to kind of extrapolate the trend line from 2015 to 2017, um, you'd think we would be down in the you know, 275 per watt range. And that's making a lot of assumptions on some other things with the global market, et cetera. But I think they're, you know, conservative assumptions. Um, we see here, you know, one that just the, the huge run up in pricing um, that we all saw in the, you know, August to October timeframe, uh, 2017. Um, you know, prices have, have stabilized and they're, you know, they're, they're on that same trajectory um, that we thought we'd be seeing. Um, 
you know, they're just kind of, you know, it's kind of a lost two or three months in terms of huge increase. You know, now we're starting to see prices at, at you know, kind of pre-tariff points and, uh, and maybe we'll see the, I think when we talk about technology, we'll see some of this impact, but, um, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing those market impacts bear out, you know, we're just burdened with that, um, you know, 30% soon to be 25% impact. Um, it's really regrettable, you know, it, it feels, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be a dead horse, but it feels like we lost a lot of ground for, um, um, political ends. let's leave it at that. Um, product preferences. Another great thing that comes out of this, green, uh, this Energy Sage um, report is it shows, you know, from your guys' perspective, from the installer's perspective, how many things are being offered. Um, you know, how many, how many different products would a, a given installer carry or offer uh, in a given period? So, uh, and I'm going a little out of order here, but, um, you know, we look, at, we look at trends, you know, starting in the 2015 timeframe. Um, and, and the way that I look at this data is I think, if you can see my mouse here, um, you know, I think about the cumulative effect. So, okay, somewhere around 65% of people in, in the first half in 2015 carried only one or two brands of modules. Um, and then, you know, as we see, uh, you know, we see the price, you know, think about, about this time in 2017, tariff impact, news on that. Um, we saw some, um, um, we saw some closures and some market constraints and specific uh, suppliers. Uh, and really what that's going to do is that's going to make, um, you know, that's going to, A, give you guys reason to go out and kind of, uh, shop modules again to, to examine your supply contracts and and really what uh, you know force I think a lot of installers to think about what are the brands I can rely on who can I depend upon you know being around uh, moving forward because um, you know ultimately it's 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 your name that that installers are that excuse me that homeowners are going to remember you guys are going to be the ones getting the call um, and if anything happens to those modules and the company's not there, obviously that's a reflection on, you know, on the installer as well to some extent. So I think um, a lot of a lot of turn in the market in terms of um, what's out there available and, and, and reliable, as well as on the on the real product side, I think a lot um, a lot of products and a lot of brands have made huge increases in uh, call it the competitiveness of their modules. So not just, you know, what are the watt classes what are the prices, but what's the value really? How does this product compare to something else given the price I'm paying for it and its efficiency and its, and its um, you know, brand name reliability market? All of that would go into, I think really a much more competitive market um, in, uh, in the second half of 2018 that we're seeing now. Another couple of trends we've clearly picked up on, you know, a push to break through the 300 watt threshold, call it definitively and permanently. Um, it's definitely, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of behavioral psychology that goes into thinking about you know the thresholds at certain numbers. Think about the example with uh, buying gasoline and the fact that we we buy gasoline not to the penny but to the nine tenths of a penny because it feels good to say I bought it two ninety nine nine rather than three. Um, you know it applies to modules as well. You know having your having your salespeople feel more comfortable selling something that starts with a three and now you know selling something that starts with a three. Three one instead of a three zero, um, you know we get it. Uh, we've seen that. We've we've built a product portfolio accordingly. Um, the other big trend here, and I don't I don't have it, you know a nice pretty image for it, but um, really the the push towards monocrystalline across the board. Uh, and as we look at some of the you know what I would call power adders or uh, differentiators among monocrystalline panels, is you know a, a huge push towards. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll cover this in a few slides, but a huge push towards um, split cut cells and, and perk technology. Um, trying to keep myself on track here, talking about you know big determinants of uh, availability in terms of what's offered and, and at what pricing. Um, we can't we can't not talk about the ITC. So um, I think most people are familiar with um, uh, the slide here on the left. It's it's my own format. It's a little not quite as pretty as I wanted it to be, but basically just want to il illustrate by date the, the, the step down of the ITC. And the big clause here is by commenced construction date. Um, so through the end of 2019, products commenced um, in that period, 30% ITC. 
step down the following year down to 26 percent um, anything not commenced by 2020 down to 22 percent and then finally the big um, I guess the big drop from 22 to 10 percent um, beginning January 1st 2022 um, the huge takeaway in the uh, extension here has to do with um, the commenced construction clause so you know and this changed a, a few years ago but um, we're not seeing uh, we're not seeing the the, the typical um, I guess clause on um, when the credit can be claimed of you know kind of installed and in, in, in invoiced that year um, we've been given the extension of commenced construction now you would think um, without going through these clauses that I've outlined here commenced construction on a residential product is hey that's pretty you know that's not a long amount of time until I invoice it um, commence construction I've got it installed um, I may get it um, approved by the uh, by the inspector a couple of days later I may get PTO from um, out here in California from your investor owned utility or your municipal another two weeks after that so you would think in a lot of the projects that we see that uh, you know the time between commence construction and, and kind of closed project is you know three four weeks um, a couple advantageous clauses that were posted to this that uh, really could stretch that out quite a bit for for certain projects and certain types of investment um, the first is you know what we would, I, I think is being called continuous efforts towards completion um, five percent safe harbor so if if five percent of the um, I think that again consult your your tax professional but if five percent of the project um, value is undertaken um, at these dates, the project can then be finished in a prior in a in a subsequent period. So let me give an example. Um, I have five percent of the value of a project of a residential install. Let's say it's uh, three dollars a watt is my end price. Um, so I need to have approximately fifteen cents of value for that project in uh, you know purchased and acquired and in use uh, in December of 2019. And then finish the project, call it in January of 2020. I'm able to get the 30% because I've got, you know, 15% or excuse me, 15 cents per watt invested in that project uh, in the prior period. Now, okay, what do you call 15 cents? It can't be, um, you know, you can't just say I did all my marketing in 2019. It's got to be, um, um, it's got to be material. Um, certain other requirements there on on what it can be. Um, you also have to pass. Um, another clause which is uh, a continuous program of construction so something has to be ongoing with that project from the period of which you safe harbored the the project to the period where you closed it um, don't take my word for it for what that would mean but I think you would have to show that um, you know the material is procured at the safe harbor point there was ongoing engineering or project management or review um, until the project closed you can't um, you know you you cannot buy a bunch of, of conduit and say that's um, that's 15 percent of the projects I'm going to do in 2022. Um, it's got to be material in nature. It has to pack it past the, the continuous purpose of construction. A lot of things. Again, you know, I started this by talking about the residential perspective of this. Not to demean our, our, our business, of course, but, you know, from the um, from the purchasing of equipment, you know, I'm hopefully tied to to the design of a project to its closure can you know really in theory only be so long before you you know you you lose the customer's attention and, and project goes south or gets canceled um not so on those really large sectors of our market that control huge swings in the supply and demand so going back to the beginning of our talk here we talked about big drivers of the you know u.s residential module market are the huge impact that china can have on um global market demand we're going to assume for this sake that that doesn't change because they're not subject to what we're talking about in NTC and let's hope that they keep their programs the same. So that remains the same. But again, in the US, um, two thirds of our 13 gigawatt market is commercial and utility scale. And those are definitely areas where you can buy the material up front. If you're willing to take this risk, buy the material up front, continuously work on the project, do engineering, do site surveys, do permitting and financing, um, and then close the period, close the project in a subsequent period. So we're really going to see this 
uh, hit our market hard. Uh, it, it, my belief here, sitting in, in my office on you know Friday, December 14th, 2018, my belief we're going to see a lot of this take place um, the second half of next year, where um, you know where projects will be um, safe harbored, and I think I think a fair amount of this is going to be on the module front. Um, if you think about the equipment that can be safe harbored kind of advantageously in terms of how much, you know, uh, how do you get to 15% of a project, utility scale projects quoting in the, geez, the, the low $1 range, you know, a dollar, dollar ten, dollar twenty, dollar thirty. Um, how do you get to 15% of those projects, you know, easily and not taking up huge amounts of space? Um, I think modules is a great way to do it. So, you know, we're expecting to see a lot of the safe harbor activity occur in the commercial and utility scale markets at the at the tail end of, of 2019. Um, now, you might say, okay, that's great. I don't sell 72 cell projects. I don't participate in that, those markets. Not a problem. True, but again, you know, when we think about what, uh, when, a, when a sales manufacturer may not know what, you know, what type of product it's going into or what type of project, uh, we expect a lot of that um, availability of cells, let's call it, to be diverted to, to safe harboring. So I think it's a safe assumption um, in the second half of 2019 that we will see some scarcity of demand, excuse me, scarcity of supply. Um, and, uh, you know, we may likely see prices rise in, in, in the second half of 2019. So uh, if you are one of those customers, and we've got lots of them who do, you know, who do commercial, who mix in commercial projects to residential, who do maybe commercial rooftop only, um, definitely something to be thinking about how you, you know, how can you quote products that will have uh, not guaranteed availability because there's no such thing, but which projects and products are more likely to be available, which products are less susceptible to big swings in demand, um, which products, you know, are going to be stocked um, here at AE Solar, of course, but in, you know, in other places in the market, um, lots of things to take into account when you're quoting some of those projects at the beginning of 2019. Um, and maybe thinking about your own, you know, inventory strategy for the next for the next year. Lots to take in there. On the, um, you know, we kind of talked about the the, the U.S. market at large, um, what we think might happen with the ITC. I wanted to speak a little bit to some predictions we saw um, in in prior years for module power, uh, module types. Um, we'll talk in a few slides about the mix. Um, so this one comes from ITRPV, uh, their 2015 report on, you know, module technologies and forecasts. And this is interesting, uh, I think, to, you know, kind of um, look back in retrospect over a previous forecast for essentially where we are now. So, um, you know, we're kind of right in between their analysis years. Uh, we'll lean towards the 2019 picture because I think we've got some pretty good visibility of what will be offered and available in those spots. But um, looking at a back contact and type mono. So the, you know, the LG Neon R product line we sell, um, that product, you know, it's past 350 and it's into 360 in terms of what's being quoted and available. We beat that mark. Um, the next one down, um, N-type monosilicon. So, you know, the best analysis here is the, uh, is the LG Neon 2 lineup. Um, uh, we've got the 330 available now. Um, the 335 and the 340 are what we're planning for. Um, for 2019, you know, we've beat this mark. Moving down and thinking about um, 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 P-type mono, P-type mono perk. Uh, you know, those are products where we were looking at the, you know, the, the 300, the 305 watt classes. We're there now. We're going to beat those in 2019. So I, I don't want to belabor this too much, but it's, I don't know. It's it's exciting for me to think that um, you know, typically these are these are optimistic forecasts when they get put out of what what watt classes are going to be out there and available, and typically we think about okay, five watt class, you know, five watts per per two quarters, or you know, five watts per year. Um, we're beating those rates. It's really incredible to think about how quickly we're pushing the envelope on watts per square foot and um, and, and 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 module efficiency as well. Um, Similar to that IT, ITRPV report from 2015, you know, we look at some information from the 2017 report where they try to forecast um, what's the share of, of material type across the global market. Um, and again, we got to think global market, you know, a huge portion of that market is extremely price sensitive and they're not interested in the, you know, the cutting edge mono P type, mono N type. 
Um, in uh, heading into 2019, we thought we'd see, I don't know, 15% multicrystalline p-type. Um, that may be, we don't, we don't see that here in the U.S. market much. Um, we thought we'd see somewhere around, you know, 40, 45%, um, you know, kind of higher performing p-type. Um, see some of that product. Um, you know, I think if you think, think about what's being offered in the 300, the 305 watt plus, yes, definitely. I'd say those are, those are kind of high volume runner products. Um, the, the P-type mono being, you know, really the bread and butter mainstay of the residential market. Um, in 2017, I don't think we, I don't think we saw the, the huge amounts of N-type mono that would be sold in the U.S. market in, in 2018 and 2019. When you look at some, some other data, I don't have, I don't have much of it here on, you know, market shares by, by manufacturer and you see, you know, SunPower is still doing really well in the, in the U.S. market. Um, LG and Panasonic, the, the, the big share gains they've made. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see um, how quickly that's changed. And um, I think how, how you, how, I'll, I'll say you guys, because it's not me doing it, but how, how installers have really kind of pushed the value, uh, the increased, um, you know, the increased harvest, the increased efficiency, um, the better economics of an N-type mono and the, um, uh, and really getting, out and getting those out into the market and in front of homeowners kind of ahead of schedule. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, the other thing to think about, not just the, not just the cell technology, but the, the module technology, full cells versus half cut cells. Um, for the 2015 report, I don't think anybody really expected to see, um, you know, the big, uh, the big paradigm shifts on, um, on half cut cells and how prevalent they would become um, in, in this U.S. market. So, not a whole lot to say here, except you know the forecast was wrong and people saw the value a lot more quickly than um, you know some of the analysts did. Just to speak briefly about half cut cells, um, so it's, it's uh, kind of Ohm's law in a microcosm, right? If you uh, if you're able to have the the current um, um, at each at each one of those intersections and increase the length of the strings, um, then uh, you really see uh, much much larger gains, let's say, um, in reducing losses. Um, that's I don't want to say that's it because I'm not an electrical engineer. I know there's a lot there's a lot more that goes into it than that. You've also got to balance the economics of you know soldering more joints uh, versus reduced losses. Um, but really, this is what we're talking about. There's some, you know, uh, there's some also some improvements, of course, in creating more, you know, kind of more bypass zones um, and being, I guess, more well suited to adapting to shade. Um, but better yields across the board. And we're, we're really seeing, you know, just about every manufacturer move into this space um, to be able to, you know, take existing cell technology. And um, I won't say immediately because these are huge CapEx projects, but in, in relatively short order gain, you know, two or three watt classes is really, um, really exceptional. And I think it speaks a lot to um, how many bright, uh, how many bright people work upstream in our industry. Um, P-type versus N-type, yeah, spoke about that a lot, but uh, again, I think, um, you know, surprising to me how quickly that's turned here in, in the U.S. market. And I think it speaks a lot to um, kind of where we're headed and uh, what we're gonna continue to see here. All right, down to the nuts and bolts. Uh, what are we offering in 2019? So, um, you know, as I, as I worked on these slides this week and I started kind of, you know, going through my mental list of, you know, the, the not the SKUs, but the families we were gonna offer, what we were really gonna invest in, in terms of, you know, uh, inventory and marketing and uh, where we really wanted to place our bets. Um, it was really surprising, and maybe it shouldn't have been, but it was surprising to me how many, um, how many big increases we'd made in relatively short order, uh, as well as the number of, you know, what I would, what I would have called a year or two ago, really advanced technologies, um, have really become mainstream, and um, I think will be really high volume products out there in the in the market. So going through um, the the REC uh, portfolio. The um, TP2 Mono is a product um, we're bringing in starting in January. This is, um, 
I think this is, this is a product that really a lot of people are going to take uh, a lot of liking to because for me, it combines um, a lot of the great things that we've seen out of REC. So first, the TP2 part of the, uh, of the product name, using the TP2 frame, um, same size, same dimensions, same, same good uh, physical performance of the TP2, uh, the Twin P2 line um, that we've seen for an, uh, a number of years now. That TP2 product was a, um, you know, a, a, a poly perk product um, with split cell. Um, you know, everything about that product was great, but it, you know, basically capped out at 290 and 295. Um, by going back to the drawing board and keeping, you know, in, 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 in my opinion, some of the best things about the TP2, um, and, and I don't want to, don't take this the wrong way, REC. I don't want to say they just dropped in a, a, a mono perk cell, um, but in, in leveraging a, a good quality mono perk cell into that split cell architecture in a great frame, um, get a 315 watt black and white mono perk product. Um, again, taking, um, we expect great things out of this module. Uh, excited to get it in front of you as soon as we can, get you some data sheets, see what you think about it. Um, also offering the NPEAK, um, which is REC's really flagship in terms of, you know, technology and efficiency in both, you know, call it supply chain efficiency as well as panel efficiency. So an N-type monoperk uh, split cell. Um, right now we've got them in stock at a 320 watt watt class, and we think pretty pretty soon into, 20, into 2019 we'll be at the 325 and ultimately at a 330 watt class. Um, Generally the same dimension, same footprint as the uh, TP2 Mono. Um, it does come with a thinner frame, but it's got two bilateral supports to reduce wind flex. And we see that um, with the right mounting location, some great physical performance on that, um, on that product. Moving down, talking about the offering from our friends at Longy. Um, two big lineups for us this year, the PD, so the Perk Black, uh, and the PE, just you know, the Perk product. Uh, and the Perk Black will be starting at a 305 watt class, moving to a 310. This is a, you know, a good performing module for us, 40 millimeter frame to be able to um, sustain a lot of the winds and, and high load conditions we see in places like Florida and the Northeast. Um, great value for this module. Um, we, we see a good warranty on this as well. On the perk side of the, uh, of the platform for them, a 305, and we expect in 2019, they'll also have a split cell product as well. Um, probably gonna be launching in the 315 watt class, so again, we see you know um, more and more manufacturers step into that split cell environment, um, really make a push to get you know two or three watt classes in one big jump, and then really fine tune the efficiency in terms of you know um, uh, flash testing and, and yield to get up you know hopefully in the 320 range uh, in 2020. So that's what we're going to see from REC and Longy uh, in 2019 from our friends at LG. Um, um, not really going to see it much in the data sheets here, but um, what what I'm not talking about is the move to uh, to the United States. Um, so they'll be opening their factory uh, in the southeast, and that always get these mixed up. Uh, Alabama, they'll be opening that up, um, I believe, in, in late Q1 or Q2, uh, and we're going to see a 335 watt um, Neon 2 product right off the bat. Um, expect by by late in 2019 that all migrated up to the 340 watt range. So. Um, Big shifts from them. I see LG really investing in the U.S. market. You know, as a as an American and as a taxpayer and all that. Happy to see them here and uh, expect great things out of LG and, and out of the market in 2019. Uh, Hanoi Q-cells as well, making a big investment uh, in the U.S. Um, you know, and, and we'll see that. Um, I've got to check my notes for the timeline on that, but I believe that's something we're going to see in 2019 as well. Um, we're going to continue to offer the the QPG 4.1 product, so the 305 watt, you know, black and white Perk product, um, as long as they keep carrying it. And um, we've seen the Duo get introduced. We've got some of that available in the 320 watt class. Um, we expect in relatively short order in 2019, that's going to move up to a 325. And I'm also hearing about a, a black on black product as well. That um, hey, we'd love to carry if you guys are interested. Uh, let us know your feedback on on this lineup. Um, best way to see what we've got. Check us out on AE Express. Um, see everything that's being offered, see your pricing, um, as well as being able to do some new things on the customer service front. So uh, if you've got any questions on that, reach out to us. Uh, happy to tell you lots more about, uh, about Express and about our module lineup in, in general.
Um, at that point, let's um, let's open it up. Let's hear from uh, Caitlin. Do we have any questions from the field? Yeah, let me go ahead and take a look. I want to thank you, Josh, and we'll go ahead and start off our question and answer session now. So if you have a question, please go ahead and submit it through the question pane located on your control panel, and we will answer as many possible questions. You can always exit the webinar at any time during or following the question and answer session. There will be a brief survey that will pop up in a new window once the webinar ends. Please go ahead and give us your feedback in a, on the survey and I will send you all over the presentation. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look here. Do you plan, oh, I'm sorry, do you have any further details on REC and Peak Black on Black? I know that's something, a great question, uh, and it's one I've asked as well. Um, I know that's something they've, they've looked into. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, being, um, being that this is a brand new line for them, um, I think they, you know, they put, a, they put a special onus on making sure that, um, you know, that they kept their focus on, you know, the first two, three quarters of that product and really made sure that they got, you know, the yield and the, and the predictability right. Uh, I certainly think it's something they're open to. Um, um, I would I would hope to see one be offered um, kind of on a on a prospectus basis uh, in the second half of next year, but I I haven't seen any firm plans for it yet. So that's a that's a long roundabout answer of saying I hope so, but not yet. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Well, I don't see any additional questions coming in. If you do have any additional questions that you'd like for us to answer, the one just popped in is, um, my apologies, we'll go ahead and answer that one. So any plans for modules with internal string level power optimizer electronics? Yeah. Um, James said, so, sorry, I forget the product ref. <laughs> okay, uh, so great question there, and I think it's one that um, could be answered a, a number of ways. Um, when you think about kind of on module um, power electronics that can go and go one of two ways. So an AC module, so a module um, that comes from the factory with an onboard um, microinverter. So typically what we're talking about is end phase, but we've also seen, you know, spec sheets from uh, or including uh, other microinverter technologies. That's something we're really interested in seeing, um, um, hopefully in the Q2 timeframe. Typically, the modules that we've seen being offered out there in the AC module kind of format have been the, um, oh, I'm going to butcher the product name, the um, Neon Ace, I think is the product line from LG that features a, a Neon 2, so a 330, a 335, um, with um, what had been an IQ6 Plus or an IQ7 Plus. Um, that's a product that I'm hoping is, is introduced quickly after the factory opens in 2019. Um, I think it's something that kind of had been, I don't want to call it deprioritized, but I think um, I think a lot of investment and attention had been paid to getting the factory open and getting everything forecasted and built and, and um, kind of put into motion first. Uh, I do expect that that'll be put back on the offer um, early in 2019. And it's one that I think we're serious about um, bringing some in, you know, hearing from you guys, is this something where we see we see, you know, big improvements in efficiency, how quickly it, you know, we're able to install it and get it designed and, and simplified. Um, that's one uh, that we're looking towards. Uh, and we're also hearing from, um, from some of our other uh, manufacturers that, um, that that option's out there. I think the big thing you've got to think about when, um, when you look at AC modules is now, unfortunately, we've got to think about two different types of tariffs. And we've got to think about the module itself as well as the, the microinverter and where the module is coming from, where the microinverter is paired to the module. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the policy changes the last two years have, have made that a lot tougher of a, of a business case to propose from some of these manufacturers. Um, I hope we see it again because I think, uh, I think there's improvements to be made on install efficiency, um, but uh, not, currently on the, not currently on the price list from any of our major manufacturers. All right, and the next question here is, any plans for, I'm sorry, um, as we navigate through the year, where 
Um, NEC 2017 is enforced in 22 states. Do you see um, do you foresee any manufacturer 